Hello Watch enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. The Omega Seamaster is a real icon of the sports watch field. From its use by the most important of diving pioneers to the Royal Navy, and of course its pretty integral role in the revival of the James Bond franchise in Goldeneye in 1995, the Seamaster has gained a heck of a history, and for very good reason. But let's be honest, you've probably all heard that before, and perhaps even from my own lips. In this video though, I'd like to look at the Seamaster quite differently. I'd like to pick out six models which, whilst not necessarily all the most well known, serve to chronicle Omega's passage through time from 1948 to the present day. Consider this a trip back through all the turning points and moments when the Seamaster as a range pushed Omega, and perhaps all watches, in new directions. Before beginning, rather inevitably, with the original Seamaster from 1948, you have to consider the origins of the collection. By that point, or indeed by 1945, Omega, like so many brands, was battle-hardened. Their watches were used to a lesser or greater extent, depending upon sources, by British infantry as one of the Dirty Dozen watches produced for the MOD, whilst their pilots' watches were popular amongst RAF pilots. During this time, Omega learned a lot about toughness, but not necessarily only from military applications. For example, whilst Omega had created the first genuinely submersible watch with the Omega Marine in 1932, a watch which was incidentally tested to 73 metres in Lake Neuchâtel, and then later to a full 135 metres, the brand realised that, for daily use, a sealed watch case and crown were far more use than a two-piece watch which had to be disassembled for time changes and for winding. Through such examples you can see how the foundations for a Seamaster collection were created. But it's in 1948 when our story has to begin, because this was the centenary of Omega's initial establishment. Launched as the official watch for the London Olympic Games, an event incidentally also timed by Omega, the connection between the Seamaster and England was clear from the beginning, as Omega began to use O-rings in their originally designated waterproof watch, as well as central seconds, two technologies they'd developed in the production of tools for British forces. Of course, the first Seamasters were, in plenty of ways, still very much in their infancy, but did add automatic winding to a truly memorable Omega collection. As many know, Rolex introduced the first genuinely practical automatic movement in 1931 with the perpetual rotor, in their own words. It was a brilliant piece of design, as inscribed on its surface were the instructions to remove it from the rest of the movement and service it, a brilliant idea to make it much more approachable as a watch. What's less well known is that the very same year Omega developed their own automatic system, which, after almost two decades of development, resulted in the bumper winding movements in the first 1948 Seamaster. But where could Omega go from there? Well, it took nine years for the Seamaster to change into a proper dive watch, yet in the meantime, the Seamaster underwent a very important change. You see, in 1952, the Omega Constellation was launched as the top-level Omega with the very best movements in the most luxurious of packages. Then, a couple of years later, the Omega Genève arrived as a slightly more affordable manual dress watch. In this context, the Seamaster needed to be a true Rolex Oyster competitor and it demonstrated its abilities when strapped to the outside of Canadian Pacific Airways Flight 302, a flight from Canada to Amsterdam via the North Pole. Rather surprisingly, the plane landed and the watch was fine, which is rather an impressive feat given the amount of celebration for the Universal Genève Pole Router, which, after all, was never placed outside the aircraft. Before we continue, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to catch all the latest from Watch Chronicler on YouTube. Remember that to read all our articles and to listen to our podcasts along with the bulk of our content, head over to watchchronicle.com. Also, take a look at our Instagram page to catch all the latest updates about new watches and stories in our articles, podcasts, and of course our videos. Returning to the subject of this video, the next model I'd like to speak about is, oddly enough, not the original Seamaster 300, but the watch which followed it. You see, we all know about the Seamaster 300 CK2913 launched in 1957, with initially very delicate, fine hands, a thin lugged case, and a somewhat strange bezel. This watch was laden with technology, some successful and some not, from the crystal screwed in place from the inside long before saturation diving demanded it, to the compression Nayad crown which worked at depth, but not necessarily in the shallows. However, the Seamaster 300, which I believe deserves to be talked about more, is the second generation launched officially in 1964. Launched as a replacement for the discontinued CK2913, the second generation was when the modern Seamaster was born. It introduced the twisted Lyre lugs which were added to the Speedmaster soon after, as well as being the watch which, between 1967 and 69, added a screwed-down crown to the package. 
Ironically, whilst the Seamaster 300 was officially rated to 200 meters, it has been proven quite conclusively that it would have been perfectly capable of resisting the full 300. Additionally, the bezel, dial design and legibility not only defined this diving segment, but were so successful that when replaced by the Rolex Submariner as the watch to be used by the Royal Navy, the hands, bezel grips and dial type were all enhanced to match the very capabilities of that generation of Seamaster. Aside from the military connection, these were also used for the divers of Conshelf 2 in 1963 when they were kept in a submerged environment for a month. I know, I go on about this quite a lot, but it was with this watch that the Seamaster went from a luxury sports watch to a real legend of the diving community. Strangely, we actually have to stick to the 300 to move to the next stage of this Seamaster retrospective, the Ploprof. In 1968, Comex, the French diving firm which specialised in saturation diving, ordered 34 watches from Omega for use in testing. Of these, 30 were Seamaster 300s with quick-set dates courtesy of their calibre 565 movements. No doubt, the Conshelf connection was appealing, whilst four additional watches were sent, prototypes of the Seamaster 1000. This tunnel-cased watch was to be the greatest chapter of the Seamaster's journey as a preeminent dive watch. Now, I've addressed the subject before, so I won't dwell on it too much. See the more in-depth video in the description below for the full story about Omega and Rolex and Comex, but these prototypes used for Comex's Hydra 1 dive in 1968 showed both what was and wasn't the future of the dive watch. You see, the Seamaster Ploprof, both in 600 and 1000 forms, the latter actually being the first produced, offered different ideas of what could be the future of diving. By using crystals up to 5mm thick, solid cases with no opening case back, and design which redirected frontal pressure through the crystal, a ring which went around the movement and therefore to the case back, these watches were only limited by the crystal deforming and touching the hands, thus stopping the watch. This occurred in the 600 at 1370 meters, and the maximum depth of the 1000 is still not known. The Ploprof, short for Plongeur Professionnel, also tested the idea of a button-controlled locking bezel, and a crown which, rather than screwing in, was locked in place by a rotating nut to reduce wear of gaskets. It was, in all forms, a technological marvel, yet being expensive, a few years too early to be made from titanium as planned, prone to trapping moisture as a consequence of being airtight, and being fitted with a rather unreliable generation of movement, the Ploprof never fully achieved the success of other alternatives. Nevertheless, the 600 still became a staple used by professional divers in the 1970s, whilst Jacques Cousteau's team were often seen wearing the thousands presented to them by the Prince of Monaco. But beyond the world of deep sea diving, Omega also wanted to explore another avenue with the Seamaster, the diving chronograph. Until this point, the Seamaster chronograph was a well-established collection for Omega, and one which offered a more colourful, less professional alternative to a Speedmaster with the same movement. However, it comes as a little surprise that Omega decided to explore the diving chronograph in the early 70s, as their team was joined by Frédéric Aubert, the creator of Aquastar and the Deep Star. Omega, though, had far greater resources and perhaps ambitions than Aquastar, and decided to put together all of their early 1970s innovation to make a more practical dive watch. The beginning was the automatic Calibre 1040 produced by Lemania for Omega. This was the first automatic chronograph used by Omega, and with bidirectional winding, a quick set date, central minute counter, and 24 hour hand, was a genuinely cutting edge piece. Unfortunately, it was also over 8mm thick, with a very tall dial needed for the number of hands used. The result was the development of the Flightmaster, tonneau case seen previously on the Speedmaster Mark III, a watch also to feature this movement. The changes in this diving form, though, added still further to the watch's heft, with a 17mm thickness when the rotating bezel was added, and the necessary thickening for the 120m water resistance was taken into account. Now, when placed next to other diving chronographs of the period, Few though they are, it's pretty clear that the Big Blue was perhaps unmanageable, even when matched with a thick rubber strap in spite of its technological brilliance as a dive watch. However, it also created a precedent for the brilliant range of diving chronographs which Omega still produces today. Still, the reason for its relative lack of success in period can be attributed to a number of very clear factors, notably its enormous price and the fact that other watches like the Aquastar Benthos offered a higher water resistance but also gave that diving chronograph functionality. For the next watch, we have to jump forward by two decades, as the Seamaster went through a period of relative irrelevance at the hands of the quartz watches of the 1980s. By the early 1990s, though, the luxury watch was returning to significance, whilst cultural views were also evolving. The 1990s were a period of counterculture in Britain, 
and with the running of the Eurostar in 1994, a European feeling was on the rise. This is not to mention the fact that the Rolex Submariner had changed from a tough, rugged tool to far more of an aesthetic piece and a status symbol. As a consequence, Lindy Hemming, the costume designer for Goldeneye, wanted to give the character of James Bond a different kind of watch and looked to the new Omega Seamaster 300M as the best choice, as a watch which was also worn by a lot of individuals in the Navy. Its blue dial, helium escape valve and more curved shape were new, but drew from Omega's Ploprof with the dial colour and hands, their saturation diving work with the valve, and the second generation Seamaster 300 with the twisted lugs. The result was a very different and modern piece which almost single-handedly raised Omega from the depths of its rather dull late 80s catalogue. An important consideration for the 300M was its dimensions. With a 41mm width, it wasn't a small watch, yet due to the ETA2892 at its heart, the case was thin and the result was very comfortable, leading to a very enjoyable reputation as a sports watch. Still, Omega clearly saw a future in this robust but slim concept, as throughout the 1990s they supplemented the range with the Seamaster 120, a shrunken 120m water resistant version of the 300M with no rotating bezel. Aside from a few curious versions such as the Jacques Mayol inspired edition with dolphins on the dial, these didn't really catch the eye, yet they did sow the seeds of perhaps the best watch in Omega's modern catalogue, the Aquaterra. As the name would suggest, the Aquaterra was launched in 2002 as a hybrid of land and sea, far closer in fact to the original 1948 concept. Launched in a much more dress oriented counterpart when put next to the second and third generations of this watch, the original was a delicate piece with small luminous plots on the hands and simple applied markers. In many ways the original Aquaterra with its 150m water resistance was little more than a dress watch with the ability to go diving. Nevertheless, it's proven to be crucial to the development of the Seamaster as a collection and not simply as a single watch. Entering the 21st century, the 300M wasn't just the backbone, but indeed the whole skeleton of the Seamaster collection. The problem was that it didn't have the breadth of appeal of the Seamasters of the 1950s and 60s. That's what the many different shapes, sizes and configurations of the Aquaterra did for the brand. But there's even more which can be attributed to the Aquaterra. For example, the revival of the original Seamaster 300 case, a case which came back in the Planet Ocean as a full dive watch a few years later. Speaking of the Planet Ocean, this wasn't a watch featured in this video, because quite honestly I don't believe that it really has moved the Seamaster on beyond being a range-topping variant. Still, it was the introduction of the Aquaterra which provided the inspiration to extend the Seamaster range into what we recognise today, with the Seamaster 300M sitting in the middle as perhaps the best hybrid between dress diver and full-on professional timepiece. But let's end this video with a question. Which Seamaster do you think was the most important? For me it would be the Seamaster 300M, but then that's nothing more than emotion talking. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, subscribe and hit the bell icon to always know about our future videos, podcasts and reviews here at Watch Chronicler. Thank you very much for watching. This is Armon from watchchronicler.com. Out.